tonight. Consensus crisis. Indian farmers consider resorting to brute force to make their way to Delhi as security forces and government authorities struggle to keep the calm. Making it official. Pakistan's Sharif is set to keep climbing as the coalition officially amalgamates, with Khan backers crying foul over being shut out. Vetoed again. The US puts a wrench in the works for the UNSC ceasefire deal in Gaza, placing all bets on their alternative resolution. Global leaders condemning the move labelled as obtuse. And a fox's antics. One smart fox decides to pick up a peculiar hobby and he wants the whole world to see. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening. You are joining us on World News. Lovely to have you tune in this Wednesday night. We are halfway through the week and we continue to bring you updates on the stories we report to you so far. Let's take you to neighboring India now. Thousands of Indian farmers equipped with heavy machinery prepared today for a protest march to the capital after talks with the government on guaranteed support prices for their produce failed to break a deadlock. The action, watched by security forces clad in riot gear, came after farmers' groups rejected a government proposal this week for five-year contracts and guaranteed support prices for produce such as corn, cotton and pulses. The farmers who are demanding assured prices for their crops say they are prepared with months of supplies. Police in India have fired tear gas on protesting farmers who have resumed their march on capital Delhi after four rounds of the talk with the federal government failed to end the deadlock. Delhi's borders have been fortified with several layers of barricades and barbed wires to stop their entry. Authorities have thrown up barricades to keep the protesters away from a distance of nearly 200 kilometers from New Delhi for more than a week. But the police said the protesters have warned they would use heavy machinery to push through. Today's visuals from Shambhu border between the neighboring Punjab and Haryana states showed thousands of farmers preparing to push the bus barricades using bulldozers and earth movers. We're still in the region and we have for you an update on the power struggle in Pakistan. Two political parties in Pakistan have reached a formal agreement to form a new government following an election mud in controversy. They jointly announced that the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz will be backed by the Pakistan People's Party in a new administration. Both parties won fewer seats than the candidates loyal to jail former Prime Minister Imran Khan on 8 February. On X, Mr. Khan's Pakistan Tehrik in Saf party branded the coalition Mandate Thieves. His movement alleges the vote was rigged to keep his supporters out of power. More than six days after reaching an initial deal to form a coalition, the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz and Pakistan People's Party announced a full agreement had been concluded at a press conference yesterday. Bilawal Bhutto Sardaru, chairman of PPP, said the coalition is aimed to address the country's economic crisis. Former Prime Minister and President of PMLN Shabash Sharif pledged collective action to tackle economic and other challenges. And now an update on the Israel-Hamas conflict. Vetoed again. The U.S. invoked the anger of many at the United Nations Security Council today as the nation proceeded to block the ceasefire resolution for the third time, placing all their bets on the alternative draft that is being drawn up with inclusion of hostage talks. A draft resolution at the United Nations Security Council calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza was vetoed by the United States on Tuesday. Those against? It was the third such veto since the start of the Israel-Hamas war. Abstentions? Britain abstained while the 13 other council members all voted in favor of the drafted text. Proceeding with a vote today was wishful and irresponsible. U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Linda Thomas-Greenfield told the 15-member body that the draft resolution could jeopardize ongoing ceasefire talks between the U.S., Egypt, Israel, and Qatar. We believe that the resolution on the table right now would, in fact, negatively impact those negotiations. 
demanding an immediate, unconditional ceasefire without an agreement requiring Hamas to release the hostages will not bring about a durable peace. Instead, it could extend the fighting between Hamas and Israel. According to text, the U.S. has proposed a rival draft resolution calling for a temporary ceasefire, quote, as soon as practicable and on the condition that all hostages are released. The blocked draft resolution, which was drawn up by Algeria, did not link a ceasefire to the release of hostages. Here's Algeria's U.N. ambassador. Voting against it implies an endorsement of the brutal violence. Israel's U.N. ambassador said the word ceasefire was being mentioned as if it was, quote, a magical solution. What exactly will this silver bullet ceasefire achieve? A ceasefire achieves one thing and one thing only, the survival of Hamas. Palestine's U.N. ambassador said blocking the Algerian drafted resolution would mean more horrors in a war that health authorities in Gaza say has killed nearly 29,000 Palestinians. The message given today to Israel with this veto is that it can continue to get away with murder. Outside the U.N. headquarters in New York, protesters called on the U.S. to back the resolution. Washington traditionally shields Israel from U.N. action and has been averse to the word ceasefire in any resolution. But the draft resolution it proposed could signal a shift as the U.S. text echoes language that President Joe Biden said he used last week in extensive talks with Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in which he pushed for a temporary ceasefire. Meanwhile, China has sharply criticized the U.S. for the veto, and Beijing said the move sent the wrong message and effectively gave a green light to the continued slaughter. In response to the veto, China's U.N. Ambassador Zhang Jun said the claim the motion would interfere with ongoing diplomatic negotiations was totally untenable. He said given the situation on the ground, the continued passive avoidance of an immediate ceasefire is nothing different from allowing slaughter, and adding that the spillover of the conflict is destabilizing the entire East region, leading to risk rising of a wider war. And that only by extinguishing the flames of war in Gaza can we prevent the fires of hell from engulfing the entire region. On the humanitarian side of the conflict now, the situation is truly dire. The Israel-Hamas war is more than just a tragedy for the children involved. So far, thousands of them in Gaza have reportedly lost their lives. Since October 7th, over 29,000 people have died in Gaza, and more than 40% of them are children. Jason Lee, Save the Children's Country Director for the Occupied Palestinian Territory, says that a ceasefire is the only way to prevent more children from dying. There's also the impact on their mental health. While they have no one to take care of them, humanitarian aid entering the Strip is becoming even more challenging. Rafa is congested with displaced people living out in the open, and access to other regions is not allowed by the Israeli Defense Forces. Israel's full-scale ground operation in Rafa means the children will be either killed immediately by the fighting, or die from starvation, or as a result of public health emergencies. 70% of injuries have been either a woman or a child. Children are more susceptible to malnutrition and diseases and will die quicker. The lives of Gaza's 1.1 million children depend on an immediate and definitive ceasefire. Let's go for a short commercial break. We'll be right back with updates on Russia and other key global stories and much more. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We have updates for you now on the situation following Navalny's passing in Russia and the world's reaction to it. President Joe Biden said that the U.S. will announce a major package of sanctions against Russia. Officials said the package was intended to hold Russia accountable over the death of the Putin critic and the two-year Ukraine war. Officials say the sanctions will, quote, hold Russia accountable for what happened to Alexei Navalny, as well as the two-year war in Ukraine. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said the sanctions package would target a range of items, including the country's defense and industrial bases, 
as well as, quote, sources of revenue for the Russian economy that power Russia's war machine. Navalny, the fiercest domestic critic of Russian President Vladimir Putin, fell unconscious and died suddenly Friday after a walk at the Arctic prison where he was serving a three-decade sentence, according to the prison service. National Security Spokesman John Kirby said the United States is pressing Russia for, quote, complete transparency on how Navalny died, while Biden has blamed Putin. A senior U.S. official said a sanctions package had already been in the works to mark the second anniversary of the war, which Washington would reconsider and supplement in response to Navalny's death. Washington previously imposed sanctions over the 2020 poisoning and imprisonment of Navalny and over Russia's 2022 invasion of Ukraine, including on Putin, officials, and banks. Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin has declared that Moscow has no intention of deploying nuclear weapons in space, claiming that the country has only developed space capabilities similar to those of the U.S. Putin's statement follows the White House claim last week that Russia has obtained a troubling anti-satellite weapon capability, although such a weapon is not operational as of yet. For details, we have other than a World News special correspondent Simashi Pereira from Moscow in Russia. Simashi. Yes, Anuradi. Putin said our position is quite clear and transparent. We have always been and remain categorically opposed to the deployment of nuclear weapons in the space. We are urging everyone to adhere to all the agreements that exist in this sphere. He called the accusations part of clamor being raised in the West. Putin said Russia has many times suggested strengthening the joint cooperation in the space Spear, but for some reason, in the West, this topic has not come up again. Speaking during a meeting, his defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, Putin noted that Russia has only developed space capabilities that other nations, including the U.S., have. Putin did not rule out the possible future contractions with the U.S., but reaffirmed his view that Washington's push for Russia's defeat in Ukraine makes such a scenario impossible for now. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than World News Special Correspondent Simashi Pereira from Moscow in Russia. Over in the UK now, a British nuclear missile test has failed after the Trident weapon crashed into the sea near to the submarine that fired it. In another embarrassing flop after the UK's last trial launch also failed eight years ago. This comes as it is reported that the crew of the British registered cargo vessel Rubima have abandoned ship of Yemen after it was hit by missiles fired by the Houthi movement. For more on this, we have other than the World News Special Correspondent Arunya Dikarni from Nottingham in the UK for more. Arnie? Yes, Anuradi. The Ministry of Defence confirmed that an anomaly occurred during the latest test fighting of a Trident II ballistic missile which took place off the coast of Florida. It is said Britain's nuclear deterrent remained safe, secure and effective. The Defence Ministry added that as a matter of national security, they cannot provide further information on this. However, they are confident that the anomaly was event specific and there are no implications for the reliability of the wider Trident missile systems and stockpile. The concerning news comes as the Rubima that was in the Gulf of Aden near the Bab al Mandeb Strait was hit and the crew had to abandon ship. On Monday, the Houthis claimed the vessel had sunk. But maritime security firm Embre and the UK Royal Navy have not seen any evidence of this. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than the news special correspondent Aruni Adhikari from Nottingham in the UK. And on the road to the White House now, we continue to hear a broken record message and pledge as former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley said that she'll continue her campaign beyond Saturday's primary in her home state, where she trails frontrunner Donald Trump by a large margin. Either way, her message is clear. She says, I'm not going anywhere. Tonight, Nikki Haley says she's digging in for a long campaign to come with her pivotal home state primary just four days away. South Carolina will vote on Saturday, but on Sunday, I'll still be running for president. 
I'm not going anywhere. The former South Carolina governor and Trump administration UN ambassador vowing to stay in the race despite losing the first three early primary states and facing daunting Palmetto State polls that show her getting walloped by GOP frontrunner Donald Trump by a nearly two to one margin. Haley arguing former President Trump is the only Republican whom President Biden can defeat and that the country desperately needs new leadership. Trump and Biden are two old men who are only getting older. Growing emotional, speaking about her husband, Michael, a National Guard officer deployed in Africa and a recent target of Trump mockery. I wish Michael was here today and I wish our children and I could see him tonight, but we can't. The Trump campaign releasing a new ad today attacking Haley over her tax policies as governor. Let's increase the gas tax by 10 cents over the next three years. Even as top Trump campaign officials argued to reporters in a memo that Haley has no mathematical path to the nomination and should be ignored as irrelevant and not newsworthy. And now we'll look into some humanitarian updates tonight. Sudan and the Democratic Republic of Congo are among poorly funded humanitarian crises for which the United Nations has now said that it was allocating $100 million, one of the lowest amounts actually released from its Central Emergency Response Fund in recent years. Aid organizations are grappling to attract donations amid a flurry of humanitarian crises. <laughs> That includes Sudan's conflict between the army and the paramilitary rapid support forces. On Monday, the World Food Programme warned that the violence is sending thousands of families into Chad and South Sudan each week. At least 25 million people, like Mahida Ibrahim and her family who fled the war in Sudan in January, face increasing hunger and malnutrition. What we need is food. The immediate support we need is to eat, to be able to survive. In Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, escalating clashes between the army and the M23 rebel group have displaced hundreds of thousands of people and disrupted food supplies to the provincial capital Goma. However, global aid needs reached a high of almost $57 billion in 2023, as conflicts, including in Gaza, erupted around the world. That's according to the UN's Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, which said the disparity between needs and resources had reached an unprecedented level of $35 billion in unmet appeals for financial support. The dire reality, the UN agency said, is that donor funding is failing to keep up with humanitarian needs. In addition to Congo and Sudan, the emergency fund allocation will also be used for crisis response in Syria, Chad, Niger, Lebanon and Honduras. Singapore has kicked off Asia's biggest aviation gathering, the Singapore Air Show. It comes at a challenging time for the aeronautical industry and it's dealing with a rebound in post-health crisis travel demand while facing severe supply constraints. Over 1,000 companies from more than 50 countries are participating in the air show. It's led by Western industry giants like Airbus, Boeing and Lockheed Martin and Chinese competitors such as Comac and Avic are also in town. Comac posted the first aircraft orders of the event as Tibet Airlines agreed to take 50 jets, while US playmaker Boeing saw Royal Brunei Airlines order four 7879 Dreamliners. Boeing also held a signing ceremony to mark a recently placed order for 45 of the wide-body planes by Thai Airways. It's positive news for Boeing, which is under pressure after the mid-air blowout of a cabin panel on an Alaska Airlines 737 MAX early this year. The orders come with travel demand on the rise. By the end of last year, demand had made a near full recovery from pre-health crisis levels, though it still lagged behind 2019 numbers, mostly due to China's slower rebound. But major suppliers, playmakers and engine producers have struggled to keep up with the rebound in demand. The sharp downturn during the health crisis led to job losses, freight issues and an industry skills shortage. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. 
While Elon Musk is using robots to implant chips into brains, robots with AI are also being used to help dementia patients live better life. Take a look. This is Cutie, a two foot tall funky robot with a rectangular face that blinks and has two ovals for eyes. A smile appears on the screen and behind the screen lies a microphone, 3D cameras, facial recognition and data recording capabilities. Cutie was built by a company in Luxembourg and studied by scientists at the Indiana University. Patients that have interacted with it so far have mixed feelings as it's not perfect and sometimes it pauses to start listening to patients or interrupts them when it should be listening instead. But things are looking positive for further development and soon we may be able to see a new level of care in relation to these especially vulnerable groups like dementia patients. It's a work in progress indeed and something we could see a lot more of in the near future. And finally tonight, how many times can one say a fox stole my phone? Sounds like an excuse you'd give to apologize for a late text. But over in England, one wild friend actually dared to take up a new hobby, the art of cinematography. A curious fox stole an animal rescuer's phone. The RSPCA, or the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, was called out to Surrey for an injured fox. A rescuer responded and took out his phone to document the human-animal interaction. Take a look what happens next. The fox was surprisingly interested in technology. He picked up the phone and ran away. The phone that was already recording shows the fox's jaunt through the woods, traipsing over leaves and under trees. This joyful jog didn't last long. The cute fox dropped the phone, sniffed around a bit, and walked away. It took a trek through the forest, but eventually the RSPCA worker caught up with the fox and retrieved his phone. Oh my god, I can't believe that just happened. The fox was rescued and the RSPCA says he's currently getting treatment. Well, that shot definitely looks absolutely stunning and the foxy director clearly had a very clear vision in mind. Well, that's all the stories we have for you this Wednesday night. We'll see you again next time with more updates on the happenings of the world. Good night.